Next, we have Green Party candidate Anthony Gronowitz. So I thought I'd provide you with a piece of campaign literature. My photograph on the front is when I applied for Kathy Black's job, I got all dressed up. I figured if she can run the school system, I can run the Hearst Corporation. Uh -huh. We got some good publicity, us, the Greens did. So I take it you're in favor of people with uh, credentialed educational backgrounds running the Department of Education? Yes, I, I think that would be, that's wise. That's why the public school situation is as bad as it's become. People who are just interested in making money running the city rather than building a sense of community, restoring the arts. After all, you can't have civilization without having the arts. And that means participation by all the people in the city. And, it, and, and one, yes. Go ahead. No, no, no I please. just wondered if I don't if, want to interrupt. I want to do a how, monologue like so uh, many of the candidates have. We we can argue about the good things or the bad things that the, the, the this present administration has done in terms of the schools, but when you look at the metrics on how the arts have been funded and supported uh, in the public schools the last six seven years, it's it's downward and in some cases sort of shockingly downward. Is it simply, as other candidates have said, a matter of, of mayoral priorities and saying, by God, no, I really care about the arts? How, how, how do we get that funding and that commitment back up? You're the Green Party candidate. Is it a matter of just turning off the lights and saving all the money from the electric bill? No, it's, it's utilizing the sun and not these uh, artificial lights, opening up atriums. No, solar roofs, solar panels, of course. Uh, but in terms of the arts education, um, you have to restore what was in the public schools. I uh, went to PS6 many years ago. Actually, I carry the desks from the old PS6 on 85th and Madison to the new one on 82nd and Madison. And that was in the fifth grade. And we put on a play. Three of us went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art before it was overrun by tourists when the dollar was strong in the 1950s. And we wrote a play and put it on. It was fabulous. I still have the script. Custer's Last Stand. I played Custer. Uh, so I mean, schools like PS6, with these highly engaged, more affluent than average parents, they don't have to worry so much. Uh, it, is, it is obviously schools in, in, in districts and areas with lesser uh, means where, where these cutbacks mean there is simply no music, no painting in many, many schools. Well, it's heartbreaking. I worked for, the, for a year for the American History Social Project, which is part of City University. I've been involved in education for 45 years. And I was sent out to Wingate High School, and I went to a wonderful art class, and the students were busy making paintings, um, doing graphics. And I said to the teacher, how do you get them to do all of this? She said, I go out and buy the supplies. It, this is disgusting. It is disgraceful. And it's getting worse. OK, this was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I witnessed this at Wingate High School in Brooklyn, which reminded me of Rikers Island, because I taught at Rikers Island in the late 70s. And it was run like Rikers Island, with, with weapons checks and guards all over the place, uh, like a prison, the school to prison pipeline that Michelle Alexander talks about. Now, I should say, it's serendipitous, but the front page of the New York Times features a story about the mayor of Richmond, California, Gail McLaughlin, who has resorted to eminent domain and seized houses for people whose buildings, homes are underwater in the name of the public good. It just so happens she's a Green. She's a member of the Green Party. You can look this up, look at today's times. Now, do we have to wait till New York City is in this condition? Well, in terms of class polarization, it is. The Fiscal Policy Institute noted that the inequalities in this city are greater than they've been since the 19th century. We talked about the 18th century. I thought it introduced the 19th century here. Uh, certainly, we've gone back to the 19th century in terms of class inequality. Um, whatever happened, let us say, to projects like Westbeth, 
1970, the old AT&T building down in the West Village. My parents were asked if they'd like to, you know, their income was low. My father was a writer and a poet. Would they like to come in? It was very, relatively reasonable. Why isn't the mayor doing this? Of course I would devote 1% to uh, the arts education. You know, and, and I don't like what the mayor did, for instance, to indigenous artistic communities like Rebel Diaz. Back on February, tw February 28th of this year, their complex in the South Bronx was raided by the mayor's police who violently destroyed everything. This group did murals, painting, music. They're hip hop. And hip hop is indigenous music to the South Bronx, and the Bronx is the poorest urban county in the nation. These people need support. We need support. The artists need support. The people need support. Wall Street is at a record. Homelessness is at a record. There is obviously a correspondence. Must we go back to Plato? This is all cities are cities of rich and poor. I've done enough monologue. You get the drift. <laughs> eminent domain. Eminent domain. Go after these people. They're not going to leave. The rich are not going to leave. They've been here forever in this city. It's, it's great to be able to talk in an idealistic way, but would you be willing to produce and fund a comprehensive cultural plan for New York City? Of course. Which engages all branches of government and calls for interagency participation. Well, it's not just a matter of bureaucracy and interagency participation. It's a matter of involving the communities, involving the people, going out and seeing where the action is. My, my platform embraces the insurgencies of the city, like Rebel Diaz. We, we give them support. I'm a faculty advisor to the Borough of Manhattan Community College student government. We invite them to use the theater to perform. Yes, there has to be a partnership with already existing educational institutions and the community and the indigenous artists. The agency, a lot of this money is ill spent. Yes, we have to have cooperation between the agencies, but we also have to have community involvement. And when, as under the Bloomberg administration, certainly these partnerships with all kinds of nonprofit cultural organizations, large and small, has increased, um, which some have, certainly some in the, in the, in the world of, of teachers and, and the public school establishment are, are wary of as somehow outsourcing education. How do, you, how do you feel about that, that kind of partnership with, with, outs, with our bringing artists in, bringing outside organizations in to, to backfill the teaching that isn't being done by full-time teachers? Well, that's because Bloomberg did more to destroy the public education system. He removed music and art and phys ed, which is an absolute international disgrace. Okay, he famously said December 1st, 2011 at MIT, you can look this all up, I would be satisfied with a classroom of 70 in a public education when he sends his two kids to Dalton school where the class size is 20. Why not use the private schools like Dalton and Trinity where I went to as the standard for the public schools and tax the rich and go after the buildings and the empty spaces and utilize them as West Beth was as Gail McLaughlin is doing in Richmond. Do we have to reach that nadir before we do something? It's, it's, it's a desperate situation. And stop and frisk, it's not only criminal, it is also pedagogically unsound. My students come shattered to school. How can they paint? How can they write? How can they do anything when the mayor, in his words, my private army, the New York City Police Department, uh, has done its whatever on any of the students coming in. This is, a, this is a fact, a reality, that I have to live with when I teach at the Borough of Manhattan Community College, which represents 130 different nations. Yes, there should be this partnership, but there has to be more. There has to be community involvement, and there's plenty of indigenous culture going on. All the mayor was interested in is dead art and his favorite artists. That's you, you mentioned hip hop as an example of indigenous art. Certainly, that's a fair description. What else do you mean when you talk about indigenous, indigenous art? Well, you have to provide spaces for the artists to do their work. Soho, before it became Soho and Fashion Boutique, there were a lot of artists there in 1968 and 69. It was trucks by day, moonlight at night. 
but there were a lot of artists doing wonderful work down there because the rents were low. There has to be rent control. We have to have that. As Cott said in 1980, the standard was one month's rent, one week's work. It's ridiculous. We have to curb the real estate and banking interests. We're going to have to get to the situation, as you see, we can read in today's Times, the front page. Look her up. She's a member of the Green Party. This is a national party. We're dead serious. We don't want New York to head to Detroit. I mean, Bloomberg is leaving for London. Obviously, it is our gain and London's loss. Anthony Gronowitz. <laughs> Anthony Gronowitz, thank you very much. Vote Gronowitz.info.